Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast and happy Mother's Day. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco, and on this edition of the podcast, I'm speaking with prolific tactical knife designer and maker, Jared Von Otterloo. Jared himself is a very talented knife maker, and his designs have been made by such luminaries as Chad Nell, J.D. Vandeventer, Brian Efros, Kirby Lambert, Todd Begg, and the list goes on. I myself am lucky enough to have one of his designs, The Element, masterfully made by Greg Lightfoot. His design language and aesthetics appeal to me on a visceral level, and I'm really excited to have him here on the Knife Junkie podcast and to dig into his career. But first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell so you know each time we upload a new video. And of course, if you know other Knife Junkies, share this video and this podcast and help get the word out. Now, if you want to support the show, you can do so by going to Patreon. The quickest way to get there is to head over to the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. That's the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. The Get Upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. Get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit theknifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. Jared, welcome to the Knife Junkie podcast. Hey, how's it going, Bob? Thanks, Thanks for having so, me. Oh, it's my pleasure. My pleasure. Uh, so as I mentioned in that intro up front, you've designed many, many knives for many, many makers. Uh, and we'll get to that in a second. But I wanted to know what your origins in design are. Have you been a designer your whole life? And are knives just a, a passing phase in that uh, career? Uh, not really. I, I did some thinking about this. A little bit today when I was sitting at the vice sanding, um, just a, reflecting on the last, I think it would be, I think going on seven years here in the knife industry um, in September, but I grew up loving knives. I don't know. I think you just have this part of you that you just have this attraction to sharp objects, knives, swords, the whole thing and I loved them when I was a kid. Um, He-Man movies and stuff like that I just watched a thousand times because I just wanted to see the sword fights and different things so um, I guess when I started uh, when I started you know I got my first full-time job and had some money I would buy those Gil Hibben fantasy knives like the ones that United made yeah. like the United Cutlery brand and I used to decorate my apartments and wherever I was living with these knives and people thought it was strange, but I thought it was the, the coolest thing ever. Um, so it just uh, always liked the knives, but I think as far as design and, and different things is I'm a carpenter by trade, um, worked in that for 15 years. And then my wife wanted to be a photographer. So I worked in wedding photography for 10 years. And I think those two uh, the trades and, and photography, it was, I was always looking and critiquing things, always making sure things looked right. Things looked straight. Um, just symmetry in, in photographs and, you know, there's the rule of thirds in photography and all those things, um, always seemed to make sense to me. And I guess when I started designing knives, I just knew right away whether something looked right or it didn't. It, I, I think my brain was programmed to seeing symmetry and thirds and proportions. Um, now there is an art side of it where those rules completely get broken. And I understand that, but I think for my design style, you know, there's just a way that I like my, my designs to look. So that's sort of the origin of, of the, of the design element in my life, you know, where it came from. Uh, you, but, you say, you know when it looks right and everyone thinks they know when it looks right but i think it just so happens that you're correct <laughs> when you think it looks right uh do you know what i'm saying like ev to everyone's eye what they think looks right looks right but your designs have a um 
have a harmony to them and and they're not um they're not simple designs and and so i think i think with all the curvilinear stuff the kind of organic stuff the very aggressive but graceful looking designs that you create they really do strike some sort of a balance and and you uh you say you think that's due to the eye you gain through photography yeah i i think it's it's more photography than carpentry like carpentry everything is very straight you know things are like you walk into a house and the doorknobs are a certain height and the countertops are a certain height and everything makes sense because that seems to be the you know kind of the standard norm photography was a little is a little bit different where you're i don't know you're creating an image and i don't know it's just you know when we would set up a shot or whatever you'd have like we shot weddings you know, so you'd have the, the bride and groom, and then you'd have the sun, and the, the mountain and all that stuff. And when things were just a little bit off the wrong direction or just kicked off to the side or whatever, it would just drive me nuts. And I think when I'm drawing a knife or, or doing up a design, you know, I just sit there and erase and erase and erase and erase until I rip through the paper because I just, there's, it seems like when it hits, it hits and you know it and you get this rush that hits your body and you're like, yeah, it's, that's the lines right there. You know, so you, you, you know, you finally got it when, at least in my brain, when, when everything lines up properly, I, that's the best I can explain it, Bob. I'm sorry. It, that's, no, that's, <laughs> that's a, yeah, maybe. Well, you, you say, um, you feel it in your body. And I said in my intro, your designs hit me on a visceral level. And I wasn't just trying to use a cool sounding word. I really mean it. Like some, some designs you look at and, um, they, you understand what they mean or how they might be useful or, or might have utility just by looking at it. And then other things hit you in the guts, in the viscera, you know, and, um, yeah. and, and you just know that you like them. That's, I mean, that's, that's what led to my buying this, this knife from Greg Lightfoot, this knife that you designed to me, I, I saw it. And, and, uh, you know, uh, when you, when I break it down to its component parts, yes, I like a recurve and a Tanto style, knife and I like a clip point and I like I like this kind of pistol grip handle and all that but something about the way you combine them hit me enough that that I went to the the expense and the trouble to get this and uh so I mean I I think I I think I see what you mean you know and and when you do create something that expresses what's inside of you you get that bell rung you know you're you you, you get the bell ringing in your head well, I, I don't know, like I'll be doing a design for a maker or, or whatever. And, and when the lines hit, I remember that happened with the Nell Hardline 3. Um, I don't know what year that was. But, you know, we were working away on it and I was penciling away and I didn't like it and I didn't like it. And I, I there's just something about it. Then I sat down the next day, the next week, and, you know, I curved a little bit, added this or that. And then all of a sudden it was just like, oh, man you know, and you just get that adrenaline rush where it's like this, this is happening. Like we, we've hit the line. So, you, you know, then I got on the phone with Chad and I'm like, dude, you got to look at this. This is, we've, we've got our lines, you know, and, and he agreed and you know, that the knife get got made and it, he did a fantastic job on it. And you know, that whole experience, I can't get enough of it, you know, where you get something on paper and then you turn it over to one of these makers that they, they're world-class and to see something from my brain get made at a world-class level for others to enjoy is very, very satisfying. Um, uh, how did that happen? How did, how did it come to pass that you're designing knives for Lightfoot, Lambert, Efros, Van Deventer, Nell, Beg, et cetera? Well, I don't know. It was like I started, um, I was collecting knives and I love collecting knives. I think it's, it's an awesome uh, you know, to chase the knives down and to get new stuff in the mail and experience it. We all know how that feels. It's fantastic. Um, and I just felt like I wanted to be a part of it a little bit more. Like I wanted to, I wanted to make the knives. So I, uh, actually met, uh, Rod Olson or I got in touch with him. I, I found him online somehow and I just phoned him up and I said, Rod, can I, can I buy one of your knives? And he said, well, I'm going to be at this metal, local metal art show here on the weekend. Why don't you come by and, and we'll chat. And 
Greg Lightfoot happened to be at the table next to him. So I sort of met those guys on the same day and we got to, you know, speaking on a regular basis, all three of us. And then, uh, I asked Rod if I could come down and he could mentor me and learn how to make knives. Um, but it was a way more and way more difficult. And it was going to be way more time consuming than I had ever thought and way more tools and a shop I didn't have. So I realized the only way that I would be able to contribute and, and be a part of this industry that I love so much was to do design work. And, and thankfully those guys let me, in and gave me a chance to 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 try and one thing led to another and and before you know it i'd done six or seven designs for rod and and i think greg and i have done 11 folders and a few fixed blades and stuff like that and you know as you gain awareness in the community people start giving you a call and you go to the shows and meet other people that are interested in design work or wouldn't mind you know seeing what you could do with with their portfolio and you know combine it and collaborate and it's a it's a whole lot of fun and you know that first design with greg you know i think we, i've done oh i don't know going like maybe 80 or 90 collabs now i'm thinking wow. i can't remember them all anymore it's that sounds horrible but you know, someone will say, Hey, I got this one you made and I'll have to scratch my head. I'm like, um, yes, yes, yes. That, that one, you know, I know exactly what you're talking about now that you remind me. <laughs> so <laughs> that's the, that's the sort of how all that came to be, I suppose, with the collaborating and, and the design work. It just seems so, um, it's got to be the most gratifying thing, like you said, to to drop a design and then have, I mean, it's not like you're just, I mean, you really have some of the the absolute best the knife world has to offer or, you know, I, that's, that's, that's a hard thing to say, but you know what I'm saying? Some of the, some of the legends you're, you're working with. So yeah, it's got to be a real thrill to see something that you've penned up, you know, become a real thing. And, and in some, in some cases, a stable, uh, or a staple in the design uh, um, portfolio of these guys. You know, they keep repeating, keep making them. It's not just a one-off, um, like the element I have right here. Uh, I've seen a number of different mo uh, iterations of this in a wide variety. Uh, you know, he he said he would make this one for me tactical because I like, you know. Uh, but Yeah, he's, that's a nice one. Yeah, but he really does a lot of, um, and and just looking through your Instagram page, you see these combinations of materials that are are mind blowing, and they they seem to complement your complex organic designs. How how does it work with the materials when you design a knife? Are you are you suggesting what materials uh, they should be made out of, or how does how does the actual collaboration process work once you've made the design and it's been approved? Oh, just sometimes like. Um, like these makers are so talented. They, they've got stuff going on in their brains too. And, you know, they like Chad there with that one Arizona, uh, you know, with the, the mammoth and the Zerk and the, and the abalone inlaid pivot and all the things I cannot do in my shop right now, right. you know, uh, these guys are, are knocking out these builds and they're, they're fantastic. And, you know, I'm as surprised and, and excited to see them just like everybody else is because I don't really know what they're making. They have the design and they're working away on them, but I don't know exactly what they're doing. Once in a while, you know, if a show is coming up, they'll get in touch with me and say, Hey, what, what do you think of this? Or I've got like the guys from South Africa that are running out of materials or, or have just mm -hmm. a limited availability of stuff like, Hey Jared, I've got this material and this material what should I put together here? What, what are you, what are you suggesting? And I'll pitch in um, as best I can with some of those um, type builds or whatever, but uh, I don't know. It's uh, like, I, I don't think I'll ever forget when I mailed out the design to Bob Terrazuola. Like I'm writing, I'm, I'm, I'm writing Terrazuola tactical JVO design. 
and it, it was just a, a absolute surreal experience um you know to have bob and and he had collaborated with rick clo a good friend of of bob's on that the canada cali collab is what it was called and it was just like man this is just going great i don't i have not I, seen I, that I, one i have to i have to i have to look that one up yeah um i don't know uh i'm just trying to just shed a little bit more light on the on the design end of things um you know and stuff with big california i suppose that was uh one of the first one of the first uh collaborations where i became part of a team like the california custom group with with mark and matia and benedict and and uh and jack and all of the all of the uh workers and all the affiliates to make the osteo and the mandara and that whole crew of guys man we had so much fun doing that and and you know they've gone on to doing more of the kitchen cutlery now so i don't talk to mark as much as i once did and i miss those guys terribly and and i miss being part of of the of a team you know like i i like working with makers individually but i just just some of the things that we came up with and created as a group of five people it's just five times as good as one brain. And if you look at Osteo and Mandara and all of that awesomeness in those two knives, it's because there's five guys on that and everyone constantly thinking about it and everyone being so excited about it, you know, was a result, you know? Yeah. Collaboration is, uh, I mean, not just in knife making, but in, in all creative pursuits and I'm sure beyond uh, collaboration with with great other minds is so important and you can get so much more out of what what you're aiming for or, or so much more than what you're aiming for when you have other great minds uh, with you you know I uh, my what I do I do a lot of video production and and television production and uh, I rely on cameramen and and women who know their stuff and and have ideas that I just wouldn't have because I don't have their expertise. And without them, everything that I produce would be way less. And uh, and that's that's what I hear over and over from knife makers collaborating with other knife makers and sometimes knife makers collaborating with production houses. But having five people together, five great minds together working on one knife, it sounds pretty, pretty intense actually. Well, it, it was like there was a lot of it that like the the cnc stuff and and the programming and and the wire edm and the reallocating uh oh man it, it was that was somebody else's whole whole job on that you know mine was you know getting the design together understanding what it was supposed to look like you know your basic function and you know, I drew up the storyboard and then it went on to the next guy and on to the next guy and all through these different facets. And it was just a masterpiece to me. Um, you know, that's how I feel about that. Mm -hmm. You know, it was just such a, a great effort from everybody. Um, well, how, how, how would you design your, um, design style? Oh, I know that's, that's a hard question to ask a creative person, but if you had to, to, uh, distill it out, what, how, what would, how would you define your, de your design style? I think, see, I say this to, to people all the time. I like everything. Like, it's not that I'm, I'm fussy. Like, Oh, I, I only like recurves or I only like, you know, straight knives or I only like bowies or I only like overbuilt stuff. I like all of it. I, I appreciate all the stuff, you know, and when you're absorbed in the community and when you're, you know, bombarded with it and, and, you know, getting just fully in the industry and meeting different people that do things different ways and, and, you know, all of their design styles included, it's like, you know, you, you take that awesome thing that, that they made and you, you know, add your flair to it and, and then it becomes a, a piece of them and a piece of you. So it's like, what's your style? I, I don't know. It's like back to one of the original questions. It's just 
what I think looks right uh, mm, um, yeah. inside all the different facets and all the awesomeness that's out there sort of thing. Um, and, and I like that because I, it doesn't give you tunnel vision in one direction. You know, everybody you meet, you, you've got an open mind to the way they do things and, you know, and, and you incorporate what, what you know and what you like into their stylization. And then it's just, you know, things just come out great. I think, you know, when you've got two people liking what's happening yeah. Um, and it manifests from one design with a maker to whole series is, and then we just add on and add on and add on and, Hey, I, how about this? And, you know, I think it'd be cool if you did a Hawk bill, or I think it'd be cool if we went ahead with a Warncliffe, uh, you know, and as you become friends with these guys and stuff, it's just, oh, I love it, man. I can't get enough. So. Well, as you approach a new design well, first of all, I, I have a lot of questions about that. Do you design on pen, uh, on paper and uh, with pencil? Um, but also, do you have a vision of something first and start drawing it? Or do you have a, a purpose in mind? Like, um, for instance, uh, a friend of mine uh, has an alien that, you know, the alien by Lightfoot looks kind of like a straight razor. Yeah, so, you know, but also sort of futuristic. It's kind of hawk bill, kind of straight razor. It's a wicked looking blade, and I I can only you know f imagine how you came up with that. Like, there's so a when, there's a funny story <laughs> behind that one, or not? It's just how that one came to be. It, I wanted to do a a straight razor with Lightfoot because his hollow grinds are so deep, and like that's his thing, man. Is is grinding, and I thought. You know, we'd never done a Warren Cliff together, but a razor. And, and he had been doing some razors, like not folding locking ones, but he had been doing actual straight razor. And I thought, well, let's get Lightfoot a, a folding razor. And I drew up a design and and then I showed it to Dan Brown. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. He's a knife maker that lives out on the coast. And he's like, I like it, but it needs more murder. <laughs> <laughs> So I, and I, so I took that as it, it needs to be more nasty. So, you know, I went back to the drawing board and I, I took that and, and, and I just, it, I just made it more nasty and more curves and, and then well, it ended up the, the alien, you know? So yeah. that's how that one had come to be was, was that design was just, you know, the, it just needed to be more nasty, more, a little bit more lightfoot esque, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> it is, it is nasty. You look at that. It's like, oh man, you know, woe to the, woe to the person who gets on the wrong side of that. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, the alien. Yeah. That was, uh, I don't know what year we did that, but uh, he still makes them all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, he'll go on little runs and, and does those ones. And yeah, that, um, and you know, then sort of just recently, um, I, I like I'm certain that you know of Brian Brown, uh, Brian Brown knives. There, he had done uh, a lot of Warncliffe designs and and the Jaeger and you know that, and he was becoming the Warncliffe guy. So that original, that original design that I had for Lightfoot, that where I added the murder and it became the alien. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I just, I had become friends with Brian and I'm like, dude, I've got a razor design that I think you would just do fantastic at, you know, it's, it's like, I don't know if he was familiar with the alien or whatever, but he looked at it and so he's like, Oh yeah, I can make that. So we worked away on it. We eliminated the flipper tab. He went to a thumb disc, mm -hmm. you know, he put like a darn near a quarter inch chunk of sand my in there and and you know it became the ssr the solid state razor with with brian so you know that was that was sort of the other half of that brainwave for a folding razor that that one went the other way to brian which to me is elite in its own sense just like it like the 
murderous one is with Lightfoot. So, yeah, I, I was looking at your uh, Instagram page today and just uh, looking at the, your knives, and I saw the solid state razor and recognized the lineage with the alien. But yeah. my thought, my thought was like, this, this is the, this is the straight razor you bring home to your mother. You know what I mean? This is the one he's here, ma. Look, like, look at what I got, and the, and the, uh, the alien. You know, that's. Uh, that's 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 what you show your friends. <laughs> yeah, oh, I I don't know. It's just uh, both those guys did such a a great job. Like Brian is so talented, you know, just about on every every level of it with his Damascus and 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 the uh, just the way he executes um, and grinds and and outfits those worn cliffs and man i i couldn't have been more happy and and frankly there was no other person on earth i wanted to make the the straight variation than brian brown for sure um, um i'm just realizing uh and now i can't think of the uh i can't think of who makes it but i just saw it go by on your page uh there's a a, a small fixed blade that one of the makers you're going to help me with this has been making uh, a lot of recently, and and I've been. Um, oh, that uh, the Hellcat with uh, Jeff Isgro. Yes, yes, that yeah. makes is beautiful. I didn't know that was yours, but it makes sense now. Yeah, that guy is awesome. Um, I I don't know how we met. Well, uh, maybe just over Instagram or something. Oh, he bought a knife from me. I I had sold a knife. He bought a knife, and then we got to know each other, and decided that collaborating would be a good idea. And he wanted to do a, a pocket size fixed blade. And I hadn't designed anything like that. So I sketched out a series. He chose one and knocked it out of the park. A lot of, lot of love for that knife. And uh, I, I think, you know, sometime this year, we're going to do a folding one. Like I'll do the, the folding mechanics and then I'll turn it over to him for finishing and, and grinding and stuff. So I'm looking forward to that. It's just a matter of having time sort of thing. I, I'm sure it'll be fantastic once he gets done with it. Uh, so I'm going to dig into your business here for a second. <laughs> I hope you don't mind. But it, but it occurs to me, I don't understand how this process, this part of the process works. You come up with a design, a knife maker says, I want to make that. Do you license the design to them? Do they buy the design? Or is it just a, how does that, how does that part of it work? If you don't mind my asking? Well, it, it's a little, it's different with everybody. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I've done in the last seven years, I've done lots of different ways to, you know, ultimately get paid for my design. Um, we, I, they, you know, buy it from me or whatever. And then I don't, uh, I, you, I just, you make as many as you want. I could care less, make a million of them, please type yeah. thing. And then, you know, I just have to get a feel for people. You know, I'm not a big contract guy or whatever. And if a company wants it for, you know, to go into production or whatever, man, it's the maker and I go halfers on it. And that's, that's how, how we go about it. I, I, if I don't trust that individual, then I'm not going to design anything for him in the first place. I got to get a good feel for people. And, and, you know, it's generally it's guys that I've met and get to know personally and, and we become friends. And then, you know, as you know, like your buddies in, in knives and, and you want to work together and, and do collabs and stuff. So, yeah. And that's the, the fun of it all, right? The people is the fun part and missing these shows sucks. Ass, oh, yeah. You know, I, I, again, I'll be missing blade. So I won't be down there this year, hopefully USN, but I miss my friends, you know, the buddies in industry and, and right. being sidelined like this is cramping my style. <laughs> so you're up in, you're in Canada. Um, where are you in Canada? And how is that affected? Are you affected by materials and, and uh, 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 supply chain issues with pandemic stuff? No, not really. Okay. Um, everything seems to be like crossing, crossing the border physically down into the States is tough. And there's a lot of, sanctions and protocols surrounding that and isolating when you get home and different things which makes traveling a big time pain like i i just don't want to spend two weeks isolating in the middle of the summer when 
it's cold up here a lot of the time. So we like our warm weather, but it, materials and different stuff like that and shipping and everything is, is pretty standard. Not an yeah. issue. Yeah. Okay. So you also make knives with your uh, own hands. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. how, how did you, you said when you initially started out, it, it was a lot more time and a lot more complicated than you expected and a hell of a lot more tools than you expected. Tell me a little bit, of, explain, describe how your, um, how you evolved in, into now making some absolutely gorgeous knives by hand in your own shop. Tell me that process. Well, thank you for that. I, I don't know. I, I can't seem to like anything that I make. I'm really fussy and you know, a guy always wants to keep getting better. And you know, I'm probably going to mumble a little bit through this one because I, I find it hard to put all my thoughts together with the making side of things. And I, I designed enough knives for, for other people to afford to build my own shop. So I, 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 uh, just one fall, I just decided that I was going to start making my own. I felt like I was able to do it. I, you know, have a background in the trades and I've been working with my hands my whole life. Um, so I knew that that part wouldn't be above me, but getting set up to do it and getting all of the grinders and tools and all of the things was going to take some time, um, and get a, a process down. And that actually took about a year to do, you know, before I was set up and I was, you know, I had built my shop, outfitted it, built all the benches. It was a ton of work, um, but managed to get to get going on it. And then um, started. Well, I, I flew to Atlanta to visit my my friend Joel Chamblin. He, uh, he I had done some collaborating with him. He's an older gentleman that built slip joint knives for twenty five years. Some of the nicest ones you'll see in your life. And then in the last four years of his career, he started making locking folding knives and, and I just got to be good friends with him. And he was, he's just a very patient, just a beauty guy. And, uh, I flew down there cause I just felt like I wanted to spend time with him and, and he would be just, it'd be just be fun to learn from him. So I went down there for a week and made a knife. Oh, it was a, such a satisfying thing, you know, and he helped me with it. And then when I got home, I, I knew that I, I was in for a, a long learning process. Like you come home, Joel ain't there no more. <laughs> and you're, and you're on your own learning by yourself. And it's, it's been tough. I'm not going to sugarcoat that at all. Like it's hard. I, I really didn't want to build fixed blades um, there are guys out there that build fixed blades that are just fantastic, like Anders Hogstrom and, oh man, like that is just a whole realm of, 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 uh, of the trade that, that I haven't even touched on yet, but I really wanted to make folders. So I just jumped right into folding knives and that's not easy. Um, uh, just, and I want to, if all my buddies and all my collaborators and all the people that I know in the industry, you guys have all helped me so much. Like any problem I ever had, I knew was just a phone call away to some genius maker that is the best at this certain thing that I'm having problems with. I could just pick up the phone and, and call and that's sped up my learning process, but you still have to do it yourself in the shop and you screw up so many times. I got a whole bucket full of shit that I've screwed up and, you know, a whole, I don't know how many knives are on the shit shelf downstairs that are folders that just weren't good enough, just didn't make the cut, you know, just lined up there just because they, they just weren't, weren't good enough, mm -hmm. you know, and then you finally start to get the hang of it and you finally, um, you start to understand your process and what you like to, to make and, and then it, it starts to come eventually. It's taken a couple good years though. So, so what stuff makes it on the shit shelf? Is it, is it because of the grinding? Is it because, I mean, to me, I think of, um, I think of folding locking knives as having so many things that can go wrong. Um, least of which is the 
lockup and the mechanics and how uh, the the geometry of the tang and the lock and all of that. I mean, to me, it's still, you know, I take my knives apart and fiddle with them and stuff, and I, I understand how it works, but actually doing it, it still seems like a little bit of magic takes place there. Like, what was the hardest part for you? Well, they, they I don't know, they all have, every custom knife sort of has its own attitude, I say. You know, they all turn out just a little bit different. Oh, they're they're they definitely have a lot of soul in them i guess where y you know sometimes you know one thing one part of it's going real good and then the next part's giving you a headache and then the next the part that gave you the headache the time before happened real easy and then you shit the bed on some other thing you know like i, I don't mean to be crass and sound negative or whatever but it it's very very frustrating and when you say like what's on the shit shelf it's just like you know uh, where it just couldn't become a complete saleable knife where it's just like, Oh, this lock in action is just awesome. But that execution of the final finishing, I just can't let this one out of my shop. It's just not quite there. Um, and I'm my own worst enemy with that kind of thing. And I think I have it up in my head a little bit because I've been associated with makers in this genre at, at such a high level, I never wanted to yeah. embarrass anybody or embarrass myself where it's, Hey, check, you know, look at my feed. Look, look at all these gorgeous knives that everyone's making. And then there's this little turd that I made. And it's just like, <laughs> I'm not being part of that. So, you know, it took me a long time to, to finally, to get to where it's like, wow, I, I don't mind this, you know, being for sale or this, um, you know, showing this one off until, you know, you gain consistency and then, you know, they're all become worthwhile. <laughs> I don't know. It's, I, maybe I got a bad attitude towards that, but it's. I mean, I don't think so. I, as a, you know, anyone who does anything creative, of course, you better be your, your own worst critic, because if you're not, uh, the, there'll, there'll be critics lining up, you know, to, to do the job for you. Um, but yeah, I'm just looking at these go by and, uh, looking at your designs going by and they're tremendous. And the ones where it's black gloved hands, I've kind of determined those are you, you, and that that's, those are the knives that you have designed and are making or, and well, have. some of them are like, I don't know. Sometimes I throw a glove on, I don't know. It, it just, it's all done and your everything is all sweet and i just don't want to if i do videos or pictures or i don't want to cover it in grease because it's usually sells within the next couple of days and i want the the new owner to have it all not sure. like grease free and real minty i guess and and it drives greg lightfoot crazy <laughs> he just hates the glove thing so you know, whenever whenever I'm wearing it, I know that I'm digging him just a wee little bit every time. Because <laughs> I think he was—I don't know where he was—in some airport, he found these things called hander pants, and they're like a pair of underwear that go on go on your hand that look like a pair of like jockey like tidy whities hey? Uh -huh. And uh, and he uh, sometimes just to bug the community or because Greg's been in this forever, like thirty four or thirty five years. He can about say what he wants. Everybody knows him. He's a good shit. And uh, and he wears these when he shows off his knives, his hander pants, just to dig everybody else that <laughs> is wearing uh, gloves to, to show off their new builds and stuff. But, you know. My, my actual intention of bringing that up was when I was looking, you know, as I, I've been following you for a long time, and it only occurred to me today while I was boning up for this interview that uh, – I never really knew that I, I always kind of assumed like that those were being made by any one of the designers or any one of the makers that you've made designs for. And then I realized, no, no, this is, these are the ones that he's making himself. So my point is saying that I feel like he, like you've, I don't know how long you've been actually making them by hand. You can tell me, but, but it seems like you're doing your own designs proud and you're doing the company you keep proud with the knives you're making by hand. You know, and I, I really appreciate you saying that, and that's good for my head because that's what I wanted was, you know, I, 
we all get along so well and and all of the people I've collaborated we're all friends together and we all help each other out and I just you wanted to make my own and be part of the gang and part of the guys that, you know, I just wanted to make them. And for you to say, well, I'm having trouble knowing which ones you make and which ones they make. That's satisfying for me to hear because it's been a lot of stress getting to that. Yeah. Um, just like today it's, you know, I'm out there and I'm just shaping something and you're, you know, you struggle with it a little bit and, you know, you're out there alone and you're listening to your music and it's just like, everything's going good, man. I love this band. And then it starts going bad. It's like, I hate this song that they sing. You know, you just get so, you get so angry. And I've had a few of my uh, friends just say, listen, go just step away and go have a smoke or just go for coffee and come back. And it's not as bad as you think, just settle down, you know? And, and I think, that's something I'm guilty of where, you know, you, I ride my highs and lows really quite hard. Like I'm a fairly intense person, you know, and when you get a knife completed and you, you're like, you know what, this one's pretty badass. you know, you feel good about it. But then when at the end of the next week, it's, you know, something that didn't quite make it or whatever, it's just like, man, I, I hate knife making. Like it's so hard, you know, and, and you get down on it, but I'm, I I've been advised by my friends, like, okay, just try to stay level, please. You know, you're doing fine. Just get it done. Nothing's ever going to be perfect. Slow down, just chill out and just accept things for what they are. They're handmade items, you know, and, but it doesn't help me from being jealous of, of some of them, um, it, it, which I are just far more talented than I am. Uh, just, like Seth Turner, holy shit, that guy. He's just he's just ultra for making knives roughly as long as I have. He's just amazing. And I don't know if I'll ever be as good as him, but, you know, he has the same advice for me and he shares similar um, points of frustration. Like I was grinding and I had to go for two smokes, man. Like it, I just had to slow it down. You know, so I'm probably rambling a little bit here now, but um, it's just the, uh, it's been quite an adventure, you know? Yeah, yeah. Good. So some of these are very fancy, you know, and by fancy, I just mean materials, but also, you know, like I mentioned before, the lines of a knife like this, I consider to be somewhat uh, elaborate. Do you have, uh, um, do you have a line that where something is more of a work piece and something is more of a show piece. Uh, does that ever enter into your mind? Is it fixed versus folder? How does, how does that work for you? Uh, um, I don't know. Like I, uh, sometimes I'll sit down to get some design going again. Like I like to do seven or eight collaborations and take a, you know, two or three weeks or a month and, and do a bunch of design work and, and get designs out to guys and just kind of feel that part of it for me and, and consult and, and, and work away at, at designing for a while. And, and I get on kind of tangents where it's like, man, I, I'm just, I'm really digging like nice straight pieces right now. Yeah. I'm, and then, um, sometimes I'll, you know, I, I really want to do a hawk bill or something very eccentric and then my brain will go that direction, um, for a while. And then sometimes I'll sit down to draw like a basic drop point and then you draw a hawk bill. It just, all of a sudden it's like you're sitting there and you see a paper that's flipped upside down and you're like, geez, I like that line and you'll move it over and and oh hey oh wow mm. and then you start drawing on that and what you wanted or what you were thinking you were going to do is turns out completely different like i i've never mm -hmm. used cad before and embarrassingly enough but that's just you know sort of the way that i i generate like i do everything by hand like i draw all of the all of the specs uh or like i draw the design then i go through and i make actual physical templates and poke and punch all the holes and figure it out just so that I can 
see it work and feel it in my hand and see what I actually think and is it comfortable and this is a piece of freaking cardboard and then I go from there I qualify the design to the mechanics and 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 you know when I deliver a design to a maker it's a storyboard of of four four views like the artistic views and then the mechanical views and open close position just to make sure everything is rocking and rolling um with them darn bag knives those are six pages long because mm. it's more you know sort of with the bolt on lock and different things um but uh yeah i, I don't know um i suppose i should maybe learn cad but you know i guess some of the makers it they, they did didn't seem to care like bob and and alan alishowitz and and a few of those guys just took my specs cut them out and glued them right on metal and made their own templates and then some guys have their own cutting services and different things so they take my design specs that i draw by hand and they scan it directly into their software and then they add and and do whatever they need to fit their build process and and outfit it and, and have their cad files which go to the the cutting service or what have you and so everybody had to do a little something to it anyway so no one gave a shit they just yeah. wanted they just wanted it the the idea and they wanted it working and and it would i took always took it upon myself to make sure that everything was working 100 percent, and there was nothing left on the table because the last thing i wanted to do was change the design lines because the mechanics were wrong and like greg and i in the early go like we call it my tough love stage of my design career where it was the first few knives and you know i would send something to him or and then he'd phone me back yeah jared it ain't gonna work i'm like what do you mean it's not gonna work oh there's this wrong and that wrong and then you know he got me and he's he's a tough dude like there's no picking like there's he picks no bones about nothing and if it wasn't right he'd just tell you that this isn't right you got to fix it whatever if you don't want me to change it fix the mechanics and it was about that straightforward so you know i learned really quick that if i didn't want my lines changed it the design had to be qualified mechanically and then it became paramount where it was all mechanics first because then you you go with you know you meet up with the different makers that do all the different pin placements all internal external pins all the different ways of doing things and then i ended up learning all of that too just to qualify designs for them i would design out of respect for the way they did things so that my lines never got never got changed like they always change a little bit because there's preferences or whatever but i learned everybody's way of doing things just to you know made sure that what i delivered was nice you know and and yeah. they, they could say hey you know what, I didn't have to do nothing to that. Or I scanned that in and, and my guy cut it and it was sweet. And that's satisfying. I love hearing uh, that you're pencil and paper because that's what I understand. I mean, um, you know, for for my work, I use a lot of computers. I'm not saying that uh, I, I don't, but when it comes to really expressing lines and 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 the kind of, the kind of lines that go into a design like an in a knife something i love so much i mean there are obviously some amazing knife makers and designers out there who start in cad and that's their language of expression that's their mode uh, but i understand the the pencil and paper mode and it's uh oh man i love hearing that that you that you do it all by hand it like um like bill harsey he still does everything by hand he's you know designs all these beautiful knives uh, at a drafting board. And to me, to me, it has a lot of soul because, because just like when the, when the knife is made by hand, the knife itself, and I'm not even saying like by hand, I'm not differentiating between by hand and by CNC or anything like that. But when it's something that's made one at a time in a maker's shop, it already has soul. But to think of the design also having that same kind of um, physical sweat going into it and and making the design all the way through i don't know something about that is thrilling to me yeah 
I don't know. It, it used to be more difficult, you know, before you – like you get better at doing things, and it, it always was like a serious – puzzle where you had it in your mind and it's like, Oh, I just got to qualify the mechanics now. And, and, you know, you, you, like you'd sort out this puzzle and it was, you know, just really satisfying to get your, your artistic vision working inside its mechanics. And then you get better at it and you, you know what you can get away with and you know what needs to be where, and you know what won't work just by taking a quick, quick glance at something. It's like, yeah, that ain't going to fit type thing um but when you see i've got a couple like this is what my personal spy hill design this is the little little mm -hmm. folder um when that was the next level of satisfaction was uh was you know going downstairs doing the design taking it to the shop making the templates building the knife having it come out you know real sweet kind of thing. That was a, a another echelon of satisfaction. This is a just a different flavor of the spy spy hill. So uh thank you for showing that. Will you will you open it up and hold it still and close up to your camera real quick? I just I just want to see this. Uh well this is the mm. spy hill. So learning how to hollow grind that was a bitch still still hard very hard um but uh yeah just a uh, little mm -hmm. little folder sort of thing so so how, <laughs> these designs that you make and the knives that you make in your shop you also sell right i mean like these are these are for people anyone who wants them is that right or or are yeah like if if i go ahead and, and make one and it's, it ticks all the boxes. And I'm like, yeah, this is, this is uh, sweet. I'll throw her up for sale. You know? So do, do you take orders to, I don't take orders from nobody. No, but I mean like, do you take orders? <laughs> <laughs> do people uh, call you up and say, I, I love the knife you're working on. Uh, you, the, what'd you call it? The, the spy Hill. This is the spy Hill. Yeah. So do um, people, uh, get on do you have books do you have uh, orders that you take and and fill or are you just kind of on this uh creative uh voyage to become the best knife maker you can make and as you make them you sell them um, that's that's more what it is i have people ask me daily if i will you know take an order if my books are open kind of thing um and my answer is always no because i want to like it, it's enough pressure as it is to, to get it to that point and to have, you know, someone put in a specific request for a material that I have to buy. And then for me to screw it up, you, you know, cause it's out of my inexperience or whatever, then I'm out money and they're disappointed. And it's just a lot of pressure that I don't need. And also it's materials that I haven't worked with yet where it, it would be the maiden voyage on their knife and you know they're paying you know their hard-earned money to get a nice knife and and then it was jared's first time doing this and and i'm kind of disappointed where i would like to have a few cracks at it to make sure that it it's what i expect or what i've seen or what i have seen my my buddies do that this is what it's supposed to look like you know so i've had to take all these different materials and work my way into, into getting it to that level. And then, but to have pressure behind that and money and stuff is just doesn't suit fit me right now, but I want to, like, I want to lots of my stuff out there eventually, but I'm still learning, man. And it's hard enough as it is. Um, yeah. but, uh, and at times there'll be people that'll reach out about a model and I'll just like, if I make one and I know that they specifically showed interest in it and really wanted it, like before I drop sell, sometimes I'll reach out to that person and say, Hey, I have this one and I'm going to put it up for sale. And because you showed interest, I, you know, I can, I'll let you speak for it or whatever. And, and that's the best I can do to interact with people and, and, help guys out or people that are, are really want one 
um, that's all I can do is just say, Hey, I got this. And they say, Oh, I, I love it, but I don't like that color. Or I, I, I kind of like the other model better sort of thing. So I'm like, Hey, no problem. I'll, I'll hit you up or, or let's just keep communicating and, and give me a chance to get consistent here and get good. And then <laughs> I'll have more for sale and more to offer you and you potentially a custom order one day. I can, I can f fill one out for you. Kind of thing. So season, I'm thinking you're a fool. Your ship has sailed to say yes. <laughs> so well, what's the, uh, as a, as a maker, what are your favorite materials to work with? Like, like not necessarily, what do you like the way they look the best, but what feels the best? What do you feel like you have the most control with or whatever when you're working? Well, I, I've used a lot of carbon fiber and I think that is one of the things that, um, I really like black and silver knives. Like mm -hmm. if you ask some of my, my buddies that are knife purveyors or whatever, and they put something up for sale, I'm like, that's my fave right there, black and silver kind of thing. So I was always sort of attracted to it. And in the early go, it's a little bit easier to machine and, and finish. So it's a little bit more user friendly for me um, where some of the more expensive metals and stuff, they're a bit trickier and, I don't know, just gave me trouble. Um, I've never worked much with Damascus. I want to get on to that. I'm, I've been talking with Brian Brown and Efros and Penny and all those guys about Damascus and Rod Olson, who is a master at, at Damasteel has been helping me, you know, sort of getting me motivated to, to try out some Damasteel. Um, but uh, yeah, I've been doing a lot of, a lot of carbon fiber. I never got along very well with Micarta. You know, there was just some things about it that pissed me off. And I'm sure if I revisited them now, I would under realize it's not <laughs> that big a deal. Right. But, you know, when you're learning and you get through the week and, you know, you kind of blow it on the very end, it's like, I hate you. And we're done for a long time. And, you know, I use RWL as my, my, my steel because I, I've just never found any type of, void or inclusion in it like i was using some other stuff and you get to the day where you're doing the handset and then you see a little grain in there and it's like oh, i didn't ask for this like this isn't supposed to happen you know you know and then you look at the steel and it's like do you realize what i went through to get here and you're gonna fuck me over or you're <laughs> it's gonna your it's your fault so you know <laughs> it's just i'm i'm going with the the steel that i have you know, high hopes. Like they those guys are are pretty good there at Dama Steel. They make some pretty pure stuff. And I don't know everything about steel or everything about material, but it's my hatred or how much I like things is just based on my personal experience. So, um, but yeah, I, I'm I'm very very jealous of my friends that that use all of that all sorts of different stuff, and it's just you geniuses. You know, I don't know how you all do it. Um, very cool. So, so as you uh, as you look forward, you know, into the future, what do you hope to be doing more of? Do you want to be more of a knife maker or more of a knife designer? You know, I I want to do both. I want to do it 50-50. And I've, I've actually talked to Toshi about this before and where he's said the same thing. It's like when you're designing, you're designing and when you're making, you're making, but you, when you're making, you, you don't want anything to do with designing. And when you're designing, you don't want to be in the shop. Like, you know, you're, and I, I believe that's what he was kind of getting at. We, we sort of shed light on that when we were talking one day or texting and you know, that was, and I, I totally get that, you know, so you, I want to, I'd like to do, do it half and half cause I enjoy both. Um, but you know, sometimes you're, you rob your, your mojo from the other side where you're, you know, you, you take up a lot of time doing design and you know, you're, I don't know, you're, you, wish you could be productive in both areas when you're doing it 50 50 but it seems like when there's a time where they the two worlds sort of merge and i'm out in the shop and i get five phone calls about design 
and and then you're not really very productive in the shop kind of thing and i don't know it's i, I want to do both because i love both i'm just not sure how to do it yet um i guess uh yeah it seems like especially as you're learning you know obviously you're you've mastered the design process um but maybe you feel you haven't quite mastered the making process and it seems like it could be a perishable skill you know you you step away from it for too long the material world for too long to do the designs and then maybe you feel like you slip on the on the making side you're 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 right you are right you know it's it's uh you get back out to the shop after doing a month of design and it's almost like where was i and and you know little things that you when you're you know, week in, week out, week in, week out that you remember to do or, you know, don't whoops on or, you know, your muscle memory's really checked in. It seems like you almost have to relearn it a little bit and you forget some innocent, really simple stuff. And I remember like, I just, and still like, you just sit back and you're just like, you're so dumb. Like, why don't you just, you can't, you remember that. Or, you know, you get back grinding again and, and you were doing really good for a month and then you're, you know, you're struggling a little bit and it's just like, wow, is this, is this your level of talent, Jared? Like, this is what you got, you know, like you, you, you can't remember this part. This is important, you know, so you get frustrated at yourself. And when I did photography with my wife, um, you know, I always had her right there to bounce ideas off of and stuff. And when it's just you solving all the problems and, and fixing it and making it right and, and struggling away out there or, or whatever, um, man, it can be, uh, it can be taxing on your emotions. <laughs> so, um, I, I'm probably making this out to sound all, all dangerous and all oh, it's so hard and it's, <laughs> you know, but it's, I, I just don't know any other way to put it. It's, you just don't start making folding knives it, unless you're super duper talented. And I know some guys aren't catch on and lickety split and they just, they're just excellent. They just brain just works real good with that skill. Me, man, I ain't that smart. It, and I, it takes a long time for me to learn something. And, and this is, and this is one of them things. Well, no doubt you're well on your way. And, and uh, the day that you, approve of your own work, I'm sure you will have already mastered it. Cause, uh, from, <laughs> from what I've seen, it's man, it is so nice. And I mean, the work that you're doing in your shop, and then of course this design work that you've done and that you continue to do is, is, uh, you know, it's so exciting. And, um, you know, you don't, you don't detect any artistic plateau when you actually look at your work. That's something you have to suffer through silently as a maker. So uh, we'll let you suffer silently through that, and we will <laughs> continue to enjoy your work. Jared, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, thanks. Um, I don't know. I, I haven't done anything like this before, and it's, it's interesting to sort of go through, you know, how answer the questions and stuff like that interesting and i i thank you for for giving me the shot man i appreciate that oh my pleasure i mean this is pretty much what it would be like if we bumped into each other uh at a bar and you allowed me to monopoly monopolize your time for an hour so yeah <laughs> i'm sure the next knife show that uh that we i end up at and you end up at will cross paths and talk for three hours i'm, I'm sure i so, hope so all okay. right sir it's been a pleasure. Take care. Thank you. You're listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you've got questions or comments, call the 24-7 Knife Junkie listener line at 724-466-4487. There he goes, Jared Van, Al Van Otterloo. He's got like the dream job as far as uh, I'm sure many of us are concerned. Not only does he get to design these amazing knives made by amazing makers, but he is making them and making them in his own shop. And well, I think we all know from looking at his Instagram page, they are beautiful. But uh, like I said, we'll let him suffer his way to perfection and we'll, we'll all be happy. 
uh, when he's happy. Uh, please join us again here next week for another interview with another great knife person. And uh, also don't forget the, the Wednesday supplemental, midweek supplemental episodes. And join us right here uh, on Thursday Night Knives on Thursday. Happy Mother's Day, everybody. Don't forget to get your mother uh, something or your wife something and give them all a big kiss and let them know you appreciate them. And uh, in the meantime, I'm Bob DeMarco saying don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at the knifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Knife Junkie.